right, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick things off. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Head Neck Cancer Survivorship Webinar Series. This was developed by the Head Neck Cancer Alliance and the American Head Neck Society. This session today is focused on intimacy in the head neck cancer population. Uh, I'm Heather Starmer. I am the director of Head and Neck Speech and Swallowing Rehabilitation at the Stanford Cancer Center, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's session. I want to start off by thanking Nicole Barr and Jonathan for presenting on this webinar today, and it's my great pleasure to introduce both of you. Uh, Nicole is a nurse practitioner with more than 15 years of experience in oncology, as well as a licensed marriage and family therapist. She works at Stanford as a nurse practitioner serving patients who need psychiatric evaluation and management during cancer treatment and in private practice as a couples therapist. She initially trained as a family nurse practitioner with a subspecialty in women's health and has a long-standing interest in sexuality, wellness, and relationships during and after illness experiences. So thank you, Nicole, for being here today. Jonathan is delighted to join us as well today to present his experiences and thoughts at our symposium. He looks forward to discussing his experience as a single man looking for connection after head and neck cancer treatment. Jonathan was first diagnosed with an HPV related head and neck cancer in 2010, and then diagnosed with another head and neck cancer in February of 2019. Jonathan really is proof that despite having a head and neck cancer diagnosis, after treatment, it is possible to return to a normal, active, and healthy lifestyle. Jonathan spends his working days as the general counsel to Headspin, Inc. And we thank you, Jonathan, for being here and sharing your perspectives today. Before we get started on our content today, I want to make sure that everybody uh, knows that we really encourage your questions. You can use the chat feature to enter your questions, and you can also use the raise hand function in order to indicate that you would like to ask a question live when we get to the Q&A portion of the program. Um, in order to use the raise hand, you can find that either in the, uh, the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll hopefully get to everybody's questions as we get to the Q&A session. So I would like to start off by asking Jonathan to go ahead and take, uh, take control of the floor and share with us your thoughts today. Thanks, Heather. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance and the American Head and Neck Society for giving me the chance to speak on today's panel. Um, for everybody in the panel, I'd also like to thank Heather personally Heather was um, my therapist after uh, my surgery, after the latest cancer. And she taught me both how to swallow again, as well as how to speak again. And the fact that I can speak as well as I can is really a direct result of the work she did. So, you know, you should thank your therapists. I thank Heather every day. Now, um, what I'd like to talk about is kind of go back speak about my history from the first cancer I had, talk a little bit about the second cancer and what I'm seeing. Dating um, since that second cancer has been a little bit bizarre because um, for any of you who are single out there, you know you're doing it um, mostly ver via phone call and Zoom right now because of COVID. In any event, in 2010, I was diagnosed with um, HPV-related head and neck cancer. I then had uh, chemotherapy and radiation uh, to cure me, which it did. It was great. And, um, and at that point in time, um, I lost about half my saliva glands. And I was very lucky because uh, my cancer was only on one side of my head and not both. So I did maintain half my saliva glands. Um, and, and that's important for later with uh, something I'll discuss, but it's a preview of coming attractions. Um, after that time, I, it took me about a year to really get back to feeling somewhat normal and wanting to date. And at that point in time, um, I dated a, started dating a, a wonderful woman who um, I knew from an old office that I worked at, and I went out with her for about a year. Um, from there, I um, 
in a new relationship that I spent about three years in, I actually started dating a woman who I was friends with in high school. And I've had two other relationships since then. Uh, the into, um, one of the things I'd like to talk about in a bit also is as I'm going through the courting process with each of these women, what did I decide to disclose about my health? And when did I decide to disclose it? Because that's a very important thing to consider. Um, Fast forward now all the way to February of 2019 and I start and I get a sore on my tongue and um, it doesn't go away. So um, I start thinking to myself, oh, this is a problem. And I go to my oncologist and they do a biopsy and sure enough, I have a little bit of cancer in my tongue. And I was begging for radiation treatments. Uh, it was a, the cancer was a squamous cell carcinoma, also just like the HPV related ones were, but it wasn't HPV related. And unfortunately, um, the radiation uh, was not an option. Now, why is that um, an issue? Well, for me, I did not tolerate the radiation very well at all in my first set of cancer treatments and was in a lot of pain. And um, with the second one to see me begging for that, it was precisely because I, the, the cure for me was removal of part of my tongue. And, um, and if you have faced that or faced any other surgery, whether as a cancer patient or otherwise, you know how frightening that is and you know all the questions that come up in your mind. Will you be the same? What will my life be like afterwards? And so I did, I begged for radiation, couldn't get it. And um, so they did remove part of my tongue. I, I also had a lymphectomy and, um, and there are some um, lingering side effects from the surgery also, in addition to removal of part of my tongue. Um, I can't really pucker the same way I could. And usually I wouldn't tell people about that, but this is a program on intimacy. So um, it goes into confidence. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. The other thing is uh, my lower right lip is paralyzed. So I speak a little bit bizarre um, or not speak bizarre, but I feel as if I look weird when I speak and that impacts confidence. So what I'd like to talk about today is the impact of the two sets of cancer treatments and um, how they affected my thoughts during the courting process and how I do the courting. With the first, the big issue, because I was pretty darn normal after, um, after the first set of treatments. I guess normal for me is a relative term, but I was pretty darn normal. I had half the saliva glands that I used to have, but the others were just doing great and keeping things up. But what I was really concerned about was what do I disclose to my potential partners and when do I disclose them? And of course, the first issue was, when do I disclose that I'm a cancer survivor? Um, and that was not as scary to me as it potentially could be. And it certainly wasn't as scary to me as a one-time cancer survivor at that point in time. The other issue though, uh, as to disclosure is, I had thought since my cancer was HPV um, uh, related that I could continue to be a potential carrier and vector to providing my partners with HPV uh, if, uh, if we became intimate. And so it became very, very important to me to, um, to disclose that information at the right time. And of course, it's a timing issue. You can't on your first uh, conversation say, I am a cancer survivor. And by the way, it's an HPV related cancer. On the other hand, you can't get too far down the road to intimacy um, if you don't say anything because then there, you have trust issues in my point of view. Now, 
Uh, so I, I did disclose both to all of my partners eventually. One of the things I have since learned in preparing for uh, this, this uh, webinar is that actually as a result of the treatments, um, immediately after the treatment, I didn't have the ability to pass HPV on anymore. You should consult with your doctor and make sure that's right. I'm just a simple country attorney, but, uh, but that's what I understand now. And that's really great news. If you're an HPV um, related cancer patient or survivor to know that because it's just one less bit of stress in a relationship um, and, or a potential new relationship that you have to disclose. Uh, the, uh, the next thing that came on, and I discussed the bizarre um, way we're dating these days um, in COVID, is my confidence. Um, I've actually always been a very confident person, but now I know sometimes I speak with a little bit of a lisp, especially when I get tired. I know that if I, I can't stick my tongue out at people because then they'll see that um, I have a big bunch of tongue that is quite obviously uh, not my tongue. And um, I know that uh, I can't give um, uh, kisses the way I'd like to because of the way that my lips pucker. And um, I know that my lower lip is um, paralyzed. So um, it affects confidence and it affects my confidence because Nobody looks at your face more than you do. And uh, I certainly look at mine every day. And when I do a panel like this, I see how I'm speaking. And for those of you who don't know me, I may or may not look relatively normal when I'm speaking, but for me, I can see the difference. So uh, when I'm speaking to women now uh, during the courting process, I'm very happy to be on the phone with them and to speak and very comfortable. Uh, but I do get very nervous if they ask for a Zoom date and if there's a possibility to go on a properly socially distanced hike. Um, I get nervous too about what they'll think when they see me in person and, and also what they see because it's pretty obvious from my neck too that I've had some surgery. So the confidence becomes an issue. Um, the other thing that I would say, so that is something that's really important to deal with in an intimacy situation. And of course, my feeling is if you're not confident in your, um, in your relationships, that is a, a, a real recipe for um, a bad relationship. And then the other thing is uh, that I try to be honest with, with um, people while I'm courting, and I've done it since the um, first time I had cancer, is I'm scared to death that I'll get cancer again. Um, I'm not scared every day. I'm probably not scared every month. But I'll tell you, if my throat's a little bit sore, if I bite my tongue and forget a couple days later that I have bitten my tongue, if anything seems slightly out of the ordinary, I am convinced that I have cancer again and I spin out a little bit. So it's, that's another thing that um, I've had to disclose with my partners so that they understand that are, there are some times where I may be a little distant. It's usually not because of them, but because I'm facing something that uh, I fear a little bit. So with that, um, those are my initial comments. I, I'd be happy during the question and answer period to answer any questions you may have. Um, I'm, I'm going to be an open book on this uh, panel, so please feel free to ask anything. And I'll turn it right back over to Heather. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I want to just remind everybody um, to please go ahead and uh, enter questions as we go along in the Q&A and we'll get to those later in the program. Um, I think Jonathan really hit on a couple of really important themes and I think um, your comments about confidence in particular really resonate with me as a speech therapist. 
um, because so much of what I do in working with patients recovering from head and neck cancer uh, revolves around their ability to have that confidence again. And you know, when we think about things like speech and voice, we can think about it from the basic perspective of we use these things to communicate, but they're also such a part of our identity. And when you don't feel like you are speaking like yourself, like you um, sound like yourself, it's really hard to have that confidence. So, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective because I think we all know that communication is such a cornerstone of connection and connection is what intimacy is about. Um, we also hear a lot in our practice, um, many of our patients have difficulty swallowing. And if we think about social interactions, pretty much everything revolves around eating and drinking, right? going to parties, going out on dates, um, you know, going to weddings, all of these different things um, revolve around eating and drinking as well. And so um, having difficulty swallowing can really be socially isolating and really pull people away from those intimate, intimate connections with others. So I think, you know, you really hit on some really important themes that I think probably many of the people on this webinar um, have experienced as well in, in one way or another. And I think it's really important for all of us, for patients and caregivers and, and those of us who are medical providers, really to think about the impact of these changes on the patient's ability to have intimacy, to connect with the, their loved ones and, and potentially to find new loved one. So I, I really appreciate um, you sharing um, your thoughts and perspectives. And I look forward to hearing next what uh, Nicole would like to share from a professional perspective about intimacy after cancer treatment. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Heather. And I also really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speaking, speak with so many of you from um, all over today. Um, Jonathan gave a great perspective from the seat of a patient who has been through um, a lot, been through um, a couple of rounds of um, experience with a um, cancer experience, a little bit different each time. What I'm going to be doing is speaking as a um, nurse practitioner and psychotherapist who sat with many patients and many couples um, uh, in terms of how head and neck cancers have the potential to affect intimacy, uh, the things that we've already talked about, appearance, eating, talking, and intimacy in terms of kissing, sex, um, uh, sexual confidence, um, and kind of moving forward with life, uh, both emotionally and, and physically. And, uh, you know, in preparing for this, you know, we talked a lot about the differences between being single or in relationship. Um, and I think that that is one area uh, where the impact can be different depending on whether a person is already in a relationship and married or single, what their usual intimate life is like um, can also be impactful. There's many other variables. And I'd say almost every case, almost every situation where I've worked with people in some depth around their relationship or intimacy has been unique. A few common themes that I've noticed have been definitely the maybe obvious ones like appearance and self-image, the functional ability to do all these um, very social activities using the tongue, the lips and the mouth as before. And then the issue of HPV related um, cancer and what that, what that issue brings into a person's uh, dating or intimate life or relationship is another, uh, another factor. Heather, you, I think Heather, you're running the slides so you can go ne next one, thank you. So um, a, a few things that, that I have um, sort of, that. I guess that I've picked up along the way and that are borne out in the um, research on uh, relationships in, in general um, that I think are important to uh, convey to this audience is that people often think, um, people often self-rate their appearance or even um, sexual satisfaction or sexual proficiency as very, very important to relationship satisfaction. We, we kind of have a mindset that that may be the case. And this is true to some degree, depending on how it's looked at, but relationship satisfaction by and large is actually a more strongly linked when you look at um, you know, successful relationships, uh, relationship satisfaction, both in dating and in long-term uh, relationships and marriage to attachment and to bonding. And that couples who feel bonded and tuned in and communicative from the beginning of a relationship all the way to long-term marriage, who are very responsive who um, know each other's stories, what John Gottman, a famous couples therapist calls uh, one's love map uh, and, ex and, and who, people who can accept influence um, and who relate to each other with kindness and empathy and forgiveness 
um, and lots of kind uh, gestures throughout their um, day to day life together. These are actually the things that make that matter, uh, believe it or not. And it's not that these other things don't matter or to uh, invalidate people's worries about them, but it's very much within our ability um, to um, impact these things. And so there are some things that you cannot change after a cancer experience. You can't, you can work on your physical therapy and your speech and your swallow, but if part of your tongue is gone, part of your tongue is gone and you can't pretend that's not the case. And I think that one of the strategies I work with a lot of my clients is accepting, um, kind of acknowledging and releasing uh, worry about what you cannot change or kind of compartmentalizing that worry and focusing intention and effort on what you can influence. And in this case, uh, that can be very successful because it's actually what uh, impacts relationship more than those other um, variables. And so if you make love and intimacy your project or your North Star, um, then some of these uh, physical variables don't have to um, be the be all and end all. Next slide, please. Um, some of the things that uh, really impact um, intimacy and relationship satisfaction after treatment specific to um, patients who've gone through uh, a cancer experience with a caregiver, and this caregiver can be somebody they're dating, somebody that they've been in a long relationship with, is the shift to being partners again from being in that role of patient and caregiver. And often people will go through cycles of this throughout you know, maybe cancer recurrence or surveillance. There's times where you kind of go back into that patient caregiver role. Um, and then there are times where you go back into being partners and couples who are nimble with that and can go back into being romantic partners um, and focus on that as part of what they're trying to do, um, do uh, well together. Uh, it's one of the most important aspects of dealing with your relationship after cancer survivorship. So, you know, just to give an example, um, I encourage partners to refrain after a period of time from being sort of the eating coach or the physical therapist, try to convey to the um, spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend or partner not to do Heather's job, um, but to let somebody like Heather do her job and do it well, um, and to step back and, and let the professionals and your loved one um, negotiate whether they're eating enough, getting enough calories or doing their physical therapy. Um, taking time out from discussing medical issues, um, just like we advise young parents to have a date night where they don't discuss the kids, I advise my couples to go out or go in as the case may be now in COVID, have a date night in and not talk about medical issues at all um, and not comment on appearance beyond the, you know, you look great tonight, honey, kind of uh, discussion. You wanna go back to being adults in the relationship not being, um, uh, trying to be in a medical role or being a, a parent or caregiver. And this takes effort on both people's part because each person is uniquely having a very intense emotional experience of their own, uh, mo you know, with as uh, Jonathan, so I think really beautifully spoke to these moments of real terror about recurrence. Um, you know, we're all sitting in this kind of situation with such uncertainty. And so it takes a real effort um, to shift gears and enter that new normal as, as partners again, at least for periods of time. Then you have the days where you have to go for your checkups or you have your anxiety periods and that may be a little bit off the rails in terms of uh, this endeavor, but then you get right back to being uh, partners um, together again. Next slide, Heather, thank you. Um, so with intimacy specifically, and I'm going to um, allude to and, and speak um, frankly about intimacy and, and sexuality and sex um, here, because I think that uh, that is kind of what we're, what we're talking around or about, um, is to accept the losses. Like there are losses. You, you may not be able to pucker or kiss the same way. There may be um, things that you and your partner really were part of your sexual repertoire or your, or your dance or your intimacy that you can't do anymore. And you have to really um, acknowledge losses and grieve in order to move on. Um, so I think that um, you can't jump over that or pretend it's not there or avoid all sex or intimacy uh, because of those losses. I mean, you can, but it doesn't always uh, go so well. But you can also know that the creativity that is forced by acknowledging those losses and figuring out, okay, well, what else do we have on the buffet um, can actually um, bring a, a renewed sense of novelty and curiosity um, and creativity to people's um, romantic lives in a way that they maybe haven't had in some time, particularly if you're coming off you know, six months or a year of cancer treatment or are in a long relationship. So just to give a couple of um, 
sort of brief vignettes of people I've worked with and things that they've said after doing some work in couples counseling or in um, counseling in uh, our work that we do at Stanford. I've had um, people say things like a woman who um, was um, very uh, conventionally attractive and whose face had really, really changed. She said, I had to emphasize different parts of myself when dating. I couldn't just be a pretty face anymore. I had to really show up more authentically with different parts of myself. And this actually led her to find uh, much more fulfilling relationships. Another couple that had been high school sweet sweethearts and really had a kind of you know, very habitual routine uh, for their sexual life together. They had kids. They had to trade kissing for sort of a different kind of making out. Um, and it, it brought them back to a kind of foreplay or um, sex life that they had had when they had met in high school or college before they were kind of in their post parenting routine. And they said it brought them back to a certain level of excitement and exploration that was really uh, fun for them. Um, I had another couple that really had some changes to their sexual life. And they said that the menu has changed. I thought that was a really good way of putting it. One uh, gentleman said the menu has changed, but the satisfaction has not. And they built into their menu many more opportunities to, um, to talk and express themselves. There was much deeper level of bonding and intimacy in that relationship after their cancer experience. And another couple that had really, sex life had really been backburnered and really wasn't an important part of their life together, they um, realized that they could mix it up a little bit and they actually had more sexual frequency after cancer um, than previously. So, you know, if these are the kinds of concerns or, or things that are coming up for you and your partner, you might want to consider seeking out a therapist or even a sex therapist, if um, a certified sex therapist, if, if needed to help you think about these things together. They're just parts of life that we don't talk about openly and most people don't talk about to their oncologists or to their medical providers at all, um, but are real issues. And, and I have found are a part of uh, almost all my patients' uh, thought processes. Though if I ask them, hey, did you ever talk to your oncologist about them? Um, most of them say no. So I'm, I'm the person they talk to about those things. Next, next slide, Heather. Um, you know, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, immediately, um, uh, very, I think, uh, bravely brought this into the picture. And so I just want to comment on it. A lot of um, patients ask about um, HPV. So a few words, and I'm not an HPV specialist, I am a nurse practitioner. And so, um, you know, I also want to thank and credit um, Dr. Uh, Fakhri for helping me prepare some of these slides and think about this issue as it pertains to this audience. Um, HPV is a very, very common sexually transmitted infection. It's a virus. It's a human papilloma virus. Um, it's not the virus we're thinking about most these days, but it is uh, one that uh, impacts about 80% of sexually active people um, at some point in their lives. And only some very specific strains um, carry risk of cancer. And most people never know they've had HPV and most people clear HPV within one or two years. Um, but HPV infection persists in, in some people and certain strains of those persistent infections can cause um, uh, cancers. Next slide. Um, so HPV can cause cancers of the oropharynx. Uh, it's not thought to cause other head and neck cancers like uh, mouth, larynx, lips, salivary glands, a nose. So it's really oropharyngeal cancer. Um, and uh, it's thought to cause about 70% currently of the oropharyngeal cancers in the United States. So if you're not sure if this is new news, you think, gosh, I don't even know if my cancer was HPV related. It's something you can talk to your oncologist about. They probably are aware of it um, from your pathology uh, early you know, in, your, in your cancer diagnostic process. So in the context of um, sort of uh, mental health, behavioral health work and, and couples counseling, these are some of the most common questions I get um, around HPV in, in my office. Um, is uh, I've had a number of people say, uh, did someone cheat? Does this, you know, is this a sexually transmitted disease? Does this mean something happened? And the answer quite definitively is that this is just in no way a suggestion that somebody has um, cheated. Obviously I can never tell somebody that their partner has been faithful. I'm not a Oracle, but um, it is, uh, HPV is not the uh, signal that there has been infidelity. It takes years after being infected with HPV for cancer to develop. Um, and it, it may be something that happened a long time ago. It may be something that even happened with that partner, but the other partner cleared the, cleared the HPV and it never became an issue. Am I still contagious? And this was a, a topic of a hot discussion in our pre-meeting um, discussions. I learned some things, Jonathan, Jonathan learned some things that were, were good news, um, is that 
and the research shows that if you were treated for your oropharyngeal cancer that was HPV related, it essentially treated your HPV, at least in that area that was treated. And so new partners are not going to be at risk from that area of disease. Long-term partners, most likely, and, and this has come up for me a lot in my office with um, long-term married couples, is that you've likely been exposed already and your body's possibly clear the infection and you can um, you know, certainly talk to your own primary care ob if you have questions, if, if you know ob if you are a female um, a partner, but that the research shows that partners do not seem to have more evidence of HPV than the general population. So just because your partner has an HPV related cancer um, doesn't mean that you are suddenly more likely than you would have been generally to show up with HPV, much less any of the um, problems that may happen. So that's something to set your mind at ease, but advise you to also feel free to talk to your own provider which is part of caregiver self-care is to alleviate your own worries and talk to your providers about your own personal and private concerns so that you have um, a way to take care of yourself. Because we all know that caregivers uh, often need to take better care of themselves in general. Next slide. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for optimism on the front of talking about HPV and intimacy. And I was excited to be part of this panel because when I've worked with couples and individuals on um, these issues, uh, we have really good outcomes. You know, the, the, the news is almost always good and, and people often make a lot of progress and find that this is an area of their life that can get better. Certainly people like Jonathan who are dating and who are out in the world, I have seen people um, have a lot of um, success and, and happiness in their lives and this hasn't necessarily been something that has held them back. So surviving cancer does not mean that relationships, dating and intimacy suffer. Some people that I've had, I've had patients who have oropharyngeal cancers who are, that are HPV related, who have found real meaning in um, educating even just family members about um, the vaccine for HPV, impacting their uh, children's lives and the lives of people around them in a positive way. Um, if that's right for you, if that's consistent with your own uh, values and beliefs, um, we do have a vaccine for HPV that can prevent uh, cancer if it's given uh, to people uh, before they're sexually active. So that's something that I know I've had some patients really find a lot of meaning um, in, and that's enriched their intimate life in a, in a broader sense. Um, and uh, last but not least is that uh, sexuality and intimacy and relationship is a, a really important part of life. And you, um, I would hope that everybody who's attending this feels like they have a provider they can talk to um, about these issues uh, and feel that they have a right to kind of put that on the uh, agenda of their, um, of their care and their survivorship because these are important, uh, important things. Next slide. And I think um, this was just a, a slide to acknowledge that we have had educational support from um, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, and Merck, um, and also to the organizations hosting this event. So thank you. And, and I, maybe we can open it up to questions. And then I think Heather is gonna sort of uh, facilitate and help us help the questions get to the right uh, panelist. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really, really lovely and, and so informative. Um, so we're going to go ahead and open up for question and answer. So please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question live. You can also type your questions into the Q&A or the chat function. We'll find them if you put them in anywhere. Um, I do see one question here for Nicole that we can kick off with about how can someone find a certified legitimate sex therapist um, they said specifically Los Angeles area, but I'm sure you can speak to that in so, more work. Um, so that's a, that's a great uh, question. I think, yeah, I'm still unmuted. So there um, are two ways to find help with this. So for a sex therapist, there is an organization. I've had to look it up so I give you the exact name. Um, it's A-A-S-E-C-T. And it's the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And that is a reputable... Um, organization and um, there are other certifying organizations, but I would recognize you either use a directory from that organization or a similar national certification organization that certifies um, sex therapists. Um, I personally recommend and refer to sex therapists who are also well-trained, um, usually masters uh, trained clinicians as psychologists or licensed clinical social workers um, and who are, who are couples therapists and have additional certification as a sex therapist. Not that that sex therapy is their only training, but I also know some very good certified sex therapists 
who were not initially trained as therapists. So the, the key is looking at a national certification organization and looking at their directory of um, membership uh, people in your area. So you can search by zip code on that website and I'm um, uh, confident that there are um, sex therapists in Los Angeles. If um, you run into any difficulty finding that, you are welcome to email me. Um, I have a website and I can, um, there are a few sex therapists in this area that I work with um, that I refer to sometime and I could certainly ask them for referrals in Los Angeles if that was something you wanted. In terms of couples counseling in general, sometimes these issues just take a couples counselor. They don't take a sex therapist. And in those cases, I also recommend that people find people uh, with specialized couples therapist training, not just general therapists. So thank you, good question. Great, thank you, Nicole. I think we have a live question from Bob. Bob, we're gonna allow you to speak to us. Thank you for your question. All right. Okay. Maybe Bob doesn't have a question right now. We'll come back to Bob um, if he does still have a question. Um, Jonathan, I'm gonna throw the next question to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your challenges with eating impacted your interest in dating and how you overcame the concerns around eating around others when you were having difficulties? Well, you know, I, I'm as an attorney, I'm a natural born problem solver. And what I looked for were what kind of foods do I eat easily? And when I go out to eat, or if there is going to be a, um, a meal shared, uh, especially during the early stages of a relationship, I really just focus on ordering the types of foods that I don't have a problem with. It's kind of a little bit of hiding the issue, to tell you the truth. Um, but I think, I think it's perfectly legitimate, especially um, during the early stages of a relationship, or even if you're going out with an entire group of friends, um, you know, you need to do what makes you feel comfortable in that social situation. And I think limiting what you're eating to, ha to what you feel comfortable with is perfectly legit. Great, thank you, Jonathan. There are a couple of questions that have come in through the Q&A that Dr. Fakhri is going to address. So I'm gonna um, ask Dr. Fakhri to join and, and share her thoughts on those questions. Um, all right, I'd be happy to oh, start my video. Um, thanks Heather. I also just wanna echo a great job, Nicole and Jonathan. Um, this has been really great. So one of the questions, um, one was a comment uh, that HPV cannot be transmitted through inanimate objects, and that is correct. Um, so I think that's an important um, reminder. Um, one of the questions was, uh, when using the term treated for your HPV, do you mean through radiation, chemotherapy, neck dissection? And um, I think when the speakers were referencing that, that's a general statement. So however your treatment got rid of your cancer, that it got rid of your HPV um, as well. So when we see patients um, who have an HPV related cancer, they start out with an HPV that's related to their tumor. You see if they're undergoing radiation week by week, they have a reduction in the amount of HPV that's either in their mouth or in their blood, however you're measuring it. Um, and if they have surgery after surgery that there's also this decline. Um, and so when the uh, term treatment was being used, it was a general catch-all um, for whatever mode of treatment uh, you as an HP positive or a pharynx cancer patient received. Um, so there's a question about what signs and symptoms did you experience indicating that you had the tongue cancer? Um, is it common to get a tongue cancer after the first bout of mouth-related cancer? I'll answer it from my perspective as a physician, and then I'll have Jonathan um, answer the question since I think it was uh, targeted for him rather than me. Um, but in general, if you have an HPV related or a pharynx cancer, the chances of getting uh, an oral cancer are low and the oral cancer is unrelated to the base of tongue cancer. Um, for HPV negative, 
oropharynx cancer patients. So if you get a tonsil or a base of tongue cancer that's not due to HPV, it still happens, although it's rare, the chances of getting another cancer in your mouth or in your throat region um, are a little bit elevated as compared to HPV positive patients. But, you know, we're talking about uh, 20%, we're not talking about 90% or something like that. Um, so Jonathan, do you want to answer the question about what the signs and symptoms were for you when you got diagnosed with your second cancer? Yeah, I, I developed a sore on my tongue and it wouldn't go away. And at first I went to a GP and was told I had herpes for some reason. Um, and, um, and then when the sore did not um, go away still, I was able to get an appointment with um, my oncologist who then referred me out to um, an ENT who did the, um, the biopsy and from there the cancer was diagnosed. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I, I, I made a, a, a grave error in assuming everybody knows the fabulous Dr. Fakhri, but I would like to introduce her formally for those of you wondering who our extra panelist is. Um, Dr. Fakhri is a head and neck surgeon at Johns Hopkins and uh, definitely one of the world experts on HPV and head and neck cancer. So uh, her, her expertise is really appreciated. Um, and in fact, there is a question here. I'm gonna I'm gonna route over to you as well. Um, I was in England in late 19, 2019, and the big thing going on there was the NHS was promoting HPV vaccine. How is the U.S. doing on this? So, the U.S. is doing better than it was years ago, but we're still not. We don't have high compliance. Um, so I guess for this population, the um, vaccine is not recommended for survivors, the HPV vaccine rather, I should say, is not recommended um, for survivors of head and neck cancers. Really, um, individuals should receive the vaccine before their sexual debut. Um, and so, you know, children, grandchildren should all definitely get the vaccine. So the U.S. is doing better, but we probably will not see uh, an improvement in the diagnosis of new cancers until 2045 if we keep up at the present rate of, um, of vaccination. Um, and even then it's only going to be a small subset, a small decrease um, in the diagnosis of new cancers because it's only the young people getting the vaccine and waiting for, the, the, for them to be diagnosed at the age at which they would be diagnosed. And so what'll happen um, you know, in a few decades from now is that we'll have an enrichment of older people diagnosed with HPV positive cancer. So, you know, 40 year olds probably won't be diagnosed with oropharynx cancers, but older people will be diagnosed with oropharynx cancers even more than now. Um, and then the next question I'll take um, as well, I guess, uh, Susan made the, um, the astute observation that HPV is an infection, not a disease. And that is absolutely true. It is a very common um, infection, please explain the difference between STD and a sexually transmitted infection. And tra infection is something that we, you know, people are exposed to, and most people in the United States are ex exposed to sexually transmitted um, infections. Uh, a disease is something that ensues as a result of it. And, you know, there are other um, uh, infections that were long called sexually transmitted diseases, but uh, we have changed our um, our vocabulary essentially um, as healthcare practitioners because we don't want the stigma as well um, when we use the word disease. Um, but human papillomavirus is not a disease. Great, thank you, Carol. Um, I'm gonna send the next question over to Nicole. Um, Nicole, so often I hear from patients that they don't wanna burden their caregivers and their, their partners. Um, but their partners want to do things to help. And how would you uh, recommend couples navigate that tug and pull of, like you said, not becoming the therapist and the drill sergeant, but being able to support and care for their loved one? Um, I'm not seeing the question, Heather, so let me make sure I understand it from how you received it. The question is, um, how do you navigate um, or how do you handle both your loved one wanting to be helpful? Right, so the, the patient doesn't want to be a burden, but the caregiver uh -huh. wants to be helpful. 
Oh, okay, patient. Well, I, I don't have a good sense uh, from this um, hypothetical patient who's out there in the audience somewhere possibly about what it is they do want. Um, you know, the, the partner wants to be helpful. And so that's a good sign. This is already telling me this is a relationship where there's real mutual uh, caring. Um, and often what happens is a patient or you know person who's experienced, had the primary experience of the, of the cancer doesn't want to be a uh, burden. So I see couples like this a lot. Everybody's taking care of the other person. Um, and, and it's really hard for me sometimes to understand, well, what do you want? What do you want to need? And so that would be my, my question is that if you don't want to be a burden, it's still important to know what you want and need and then know where those wants and needs should go. Maybe you want and need a new Tesla, but that may not be a problem your partner can solve, you know? Maybe you want and need a little more affection, and that is something that's appropriate to ask your partner for, uh, and then maybe very happy to give. I frequently see couples or you know partner uh, partnership situations where um, a caregiver is just really anxious and caring and wants to do for the uh, person uh, who has cancer, and but they're they're giving things that are not wanted or needed, like advice, uh, like constant coaching. Uh, but it may be that that person wants something else. So I think it's really learning in a relationship how to communicate uh, genuinely and gently what your real wants and needs are and having attunement and listening skills um, to be empathic. Uh, many, many, many uh, people I see individually who are cancer survivors uh, want their partner to just be empathic, to understand what it's like to walk in their shoes not to reassure them, not to cheerlead, not to coach them, but just to understand what it's like, what it feels like to be in their skin, how tired you can be after chemotherapy, how food doesn't taste good anymore. And there's no you know, recipe that may change that right away. And so empathy without fixing things is often, often what I hear. Great, thank you so much. Jonathan, I'm gonna send a question over your way. Um, how what helped you to find confidence to connect with others in an intimate manner after your treatment? How did I find confidence? Um, I think uh, I think I've always had a certain naive confidence in myself. Uh, so there, but I'm, I'm practicing meditation now, and um, I have to say, I think the meditation helps. I I, I find that it helps me focus on um, what is important in this world and, um, and to live in the moment. And I think when you live, at least for me, when you live moment by moment, you're, for me, it's made me a much more confident individual. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fakri, there's another question here for you. Um, are there any new therapies that show promise for head and neck cancer excluding Keytruda for example, personalized vaccines? Um, so I don't think that we have any large scale studies um, demonstrating benefit yet. Um, there is interest in CAR T cell therapies and, um, and, uh, and other HPV specific uh, vaccines, but we don't have um, large uh, studies yet. There are um, also combinations of immunotherapy um, which appear to be very exciting, um, but we're waiting for those studies. So hopefully in another year or two, we'll have better answers. Right. We uh, have another question here um, uh, from Don. He has become a huge advocate for the vaccine. Any tips on the right rhetoric to convince parents to get their kids the remarkable vaccine? Um, can, I, I think that they had wanted Dr. Fakhri to answer that, and sure. but I'd like to also join in there because I'm a huge advocate for the vaccine. And I think, I, I think as people who have gone through HPV-related head, head and neck cancer and um, being the people with the firsthand knowledge of really the trials of going through the radiation and the chemotherapy and the fear, we are the best people to be on the front lines um, to encourage our friends and family members to have their children vaccinated. And 
And it takes a little bravery because you have to stand up and admit, yes, I had HPV and this is what happened. And for some people that's a little intimate, but I think when people see somebody who is a real life, um, I don't want to say victim because none of us cancer survivors are victims, but a, a, a real life participant in the illness and um, a real sufferer of the consequences, I think it gives us a certain gravitas and um, a certain platform from which to be able to really uh, encourage others to make sure that they're getting the vaccines for the loved ones in their lives. I would just add that, um, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, we're just at a time when the word vaccine is a very political word. And, um, you know, more so than it was a few years ago when uh, people had problems with HPV vaccine and that we were giving license to people to have sex. Um, and I think, so given that more important than ever, it's telling people that this is a cancer prevention vaccine, not, you know, stay away from sex essentially, and, you know, just sell it as a, as a cancer prevention vaccine. And just like, you know, we get vaccinated for other things. This is, you know, you're due for your vaccines. Everyone should get this by, you know, by this age. Um, and I think the more we um, kind of just talk about it as just something that we all do, it, it normalizes it um, even more uh, rather than focusing on, um, on the you know, sex part. Because I think some parents have a hard time thinking about that aspect of their children. I'll just add in, I'm in discussion with um, uh, my kid's school about doing a, uh, a, a talk about this and, and in the context of all this uh, politici politicization of vaccines, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but I, I think part of it is also to ask people what are their concerns. I've had many conversations on the side of the soccer field because I am a proselytizer for vaccines uh, for, um, for HPV. Um, and I actually tell people something that Dr. Kalivas, the doctor that uh, Heather Starmer and I work with at Stanford once said to me that I will never forget when, I'm, when my children were very young, actually, um, we were crossing the street between two of the buildings at Stanford. And he said, you know, the, the face of like the person, the typical person I have in front of me who has had a neck cancer has changed a lot over the years. And I see a lot of uh, parents um, and I want to refer some of them to you. And he was talking to me about my psycho-oncology practice. And I end up seeing a lot of parents in my practice, you know, from all cancer specialties, but I see a lot of uh, parents. And I just tell people that. I say, wow, I see a lot of parents in my job. Um, people with, you know, people who are in the active years of their life who get this and that this is a cancer prevention vaccine that we can give kids. And I say, we give it to them long before they're sexually active, when they're not even thinking about it, which isn't necessarily true. But I say, you know, because kids sometimes are thinking about those things younger than parents may want them to. But I just say it's given long before then, and it's a cancer prevention vaccine because the face of head and neck cancer, the kind of person, the people we see in clinical practice has changed a lot over the years. And we wanna, we wanna shift that population. And, and I think the other um, message to get out there is that this is a safe vaccine, right? The anti-vaxxers yes. will say, you know, it causes autism, it causes other things. But I think what, um, you know, for our community service, what, you know, what we can do is say, is tell people this is really a safe vaccine and it prevents cancer. Um, so. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, we, you could see we all feel strongly about this. This is uh, something we, we yeah. all probably deeply care about. So thanks for asking the question. Absolutely. All right, we have another question that just came in. Uh, is it true that HPV can be transmitted by kissing? You want me to take it? Or you want to take yeah, this? Take it, Dr. <laughs> um, so, you know, the data on this has been controversial. Um, in some studies, it's been shown to be associated uh, with the diagnosis of uh, HP positive or pharynx cancer. Um, and in other studies, it has not been shown to be associated with it. Um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is it's very hard to separate out if someone is kissing or if someone's, you know, having oral sex. And so, you know, if someone is, we have very few people in these studies who have only kissed someone, right? 
And so it's just really hard to interpret the data because all of these things go together. Um, that being said, I think, you know, when you think about it, you look at the data overall, yes, HPV can be transmitted by kissing. So it, you know, it's, it's an exposure that someone has had over time, but the load, the viral load, meaning the amount of virus that you're gonna be exposed to when you're kissing someone mouth to mouth is very different than let's say a mouth and orogenital contact, right? Because the HPV viral load is much higher orogenitally. Perfect, thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, if we don't have any other questions, I would like to thank all of the survivors and their caregivers for attending the webinar today. Uh, a special thanks to Nicole and Jonathan, as well as Dr. Fakhri uh, for uh, their participation in this event. And a special thank you to the Head Neck Cancer Alliance, as well as the American Head Neck Society for organizing and hosting the webinar. Wish you all a very good day and stay healthy and stay, stay apart. <laughs> Not in the context of HPV though, Heather. Correct. <laughs> stay <laughs> apart for COVID. Stay apart for COVID, but stay <laughs> for HPV. <laughs> All right. Good job.